Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Here we go. Uh, from the New King James Version of the Bible, the Apostle Paul writing here to the Colossians. And notice it says this, chapter one, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Well, let me just comment on the Timothy thing. Paul will uh, regularly, uh, at least in the New Testament letters that we have, and we presume in other letters that he wrote, but he doesn't only include himself if there is someone else there with him, maybe even contributing to uh, the thoughts that he's writing uh, in these letters. And in this case, it's Timothy. Other times it's Sosthenes or others. And so he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. Oh, I love this. Paul is not being arrogant. He's not boasting. He's not trying to puff himself up because we know that would not be anointed, that would not be inspired. But Paul is establishing right at the beginning of this letter, not only who's writing, but by what authority he has to write to the Philippians, or excuse me, to the Colossians here. And he says this, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. This is the will of God, he is saying, for me to be an apostle and for me to write to you and to minister to you, to serve you, to teach you, to instruct you and such. So Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, that's who it's from. Now, who is it to? To the church, verse two, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. Now, of course, this would be, as I like to point out, this would be house churches, but collectively these house churches in the city of Colossae would make up the church or the saints of Colossae. And so he's saying, I'm writing to all the saints of all the house churches, however many of them, of them we are. We don't know exactly how many, but I'm writing to them. And then he brings his greeting that he so uh, often does, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was not just writing something sort of as a, uh, a normal formality that means nothing just to take up room in the letter, or just to make it sound good. No, he is declaring this grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We should have confidence in our words that we can release blessing, we can release grace, we can release peace by declaring to people, and Jesus even would do that peace to you, my peace I leave you. As he was speaking it, he was releasing his peace to his disciples. So verse three, here we go. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. So Paul is saying, oh, we pray for you. We heard about your faith. We heard about your love. And so we've been praying for you. Verse five, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit. This gospel is bringing forth fruit everywhere in the world that it's preached as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. He said, just like it is right there with you, ever since the word of God came to you, it's been bringing forth truth ever, ever since you heard about the grace of God. The grace of God has been flowing to you. So notice the words were spoken about the grace of God, about the salvation of grace through Jesus Christ. And ever since those words were spoken, the grace has been flowing. See, this is the power of us preaching the Word of God, declaring it. And as we declare it, the insight, the light, the understanding opens up and allows what we're preaching about to come to those people. And so he goes on to say here, 
let's see, verse 6, which has come to you, it is also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. Verse 7, as you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. He said, we receive words from a word from Epaphras about your love in the Spirit. Verse 9. Now, this is one of the most uh, powerful prayers. There are a couple of great prayers in the book of Ephesians, but this is another great prayer to pray over yourself, to pray over other people. So notice what he says in verse 9. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask. Well, what is Paul going to ask? Oh, we should ask this too. And to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. We should be able to pray that. We should pray that over ourselves and pray that over other people. Lord, I pray for myself that I be filled with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Lord, I pray over my wife. Lord, I pray over my children that they be filled with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He goes on with the prayer. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Lord, I pray over myself that I may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing you, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God for my spouse, for my children, etc., etc. Verse 11, he goes on with the prayer, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Lord, I pray for myself that you would strengthen me with all might according to your glorious power for all patience. Lord, that that strength gives me patience and long suffering when I'm going through stuff. I hang in there. I'm strong. I stay strong with joy. I don't lose my joy in these hard times. Giving thanks to the Father, he's still praying, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance in the, of the saints in the light. Oh, I give thanks to you, Father, because you have qualified me. You've qualified my spouse. You've qualified my children uh, to be partakers of the inheritance. Oh, thank God for our inheritance through Jesus Christ. To be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Verse 13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us, transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Lord, I thank you that you have delivered me from the power of darkness and you have conveyed me, you have transferred me over into the kingdom of the Son of your love. Verse 14, in whom we have redemption through His blood. Boy, it can't be any more clear than that, can it? Our redemption comes through the spilled blood innocent blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, in whom we have redemption. What does redemption mean? Redemption doesn't mean simply to purchase, but it means to purchase back or to buy back. See, God, God created us in the first place. We had fellowship with him, but through the deception of the devil and, and Adam and Eve's, Eve's sin, we were separated from God. And what did God do with his only begotten son? He bought us back into relationship and fellowship with him. So in whom we have redemption through his blood, Jesus' blood, the forgiveness of sins, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. In other words, God's invisible, you can't see him. But if you just look at Jesus and see what he's like, you'll know what God's like because Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created. By who? By Jesus. See, we all would know Father God created all things, but notice this says Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Whether you can see it or whether you can't see it, Jesus created it. All things were created, whether in heaven or on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, 
all things were created through him, and this is interesting, and for him. Verse 17, and he, Jesus, is before all things. In other words, all those things that are created by him, obviously, he's before all these things. Well, Jesus didn't start his existence, you know, in Bethlehem, you know, as a baby. No, Jesus has lived for eternity past, forever. He's always existed because he's God. Father, Son, he's the Son, and Holy Spirit. So Jesus has always existed. We, our minds have a hard time grasping eternity, but it's reality. Time was created for us to exist within time, <laughs> but God's outside of that. See, so he's just always existed. And it says, Jesus, he's before all things, and in him all things consist. In Jesus all things consist. Things are held together by him. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church. So Jesus is the leader, the head of the body of Christ, the head of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Notice he's the firstborn from the dead. What does that mean? Well, nobody who believed in a coming Savior, coming Messiah, could go right on to heaven. No, Jesus was the one who died with our sins. And then when God raised him from the dead, the Bible says that was he was the first one born from the dead. When he was raised from the dead, now everyone else, the rest of us, when we put our faith in Jesus, we can be raised from the deadness, spiritual death of our sins. See, but Jesus was the first one. He took on our sins and died with them, uh, died for them. They weren't his sins, they were our sins. But he died with those sins. But when God raised him from the dead, praise God, and that life came back into him, well, guess what? Now that life can come into us, the very life of God, because we can be born again now, but we're not the firstborn. He's the firstborn. And we're kind of second, third, and fourth. In one sense, we're subsequent to him. But in another sense, the Bible brings out this mystery that when you're in Christ, when you're born again in Jesus, you're born into him. So you and I become part of the firstborn. He's the head and we're the body. So we have this inheritance from God as, we're all, as if we're all the firstborn because we're all in him. But in terms of sequence, he's the firstborn. And then I was born again far after Jesus was raised from the dead. So it says he's the firstborn among many brethren. And then it goes on to say, let's see, uh, verse 17, he's before all things. Verse 18, he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. He's out in front. He's the number one. He's the highest one lifted up. He's the one in charge above everyone else, above everything else. Verse 10, for it pleased the Father. Somebody says, well, wait a minute. Does God the Father want him to be that high? Listen, it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him, by Jesus, it pleased the Father that by him, by Jesus, to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. So it pleased God the Father to reconcile all things to himself through Jesus. See, so Jesus, he put Jesus in charge because it pleased God to put Jesus in charge. First to be willing to give him, to sacrifice him, but then to raise him up high and to make him the top, the, the preeminent one. See, it pleased God the Father to do that. So it says, having made peace through the blood of his cross. There's the blood again, through the innocent blood of his cross. Okay, verse 21. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. So notice he went through something horrible, death, disconnected with God. You know, uh, the Bible says that God even turned his face away. And Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus went through this horrible thing, but he did it with our sin and he did it for our sin. But it goes on to say here 
in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless. See, he went through that horrible thing so that you could be presented before God holy and be presented before God blameless and above reproach, above reproach in his sight. Not, not even close to being accusable. Well, that's not our doing. We, we can't measure up to that. But through the innocent blood of Jesus being spilled on our behalf, we get that new status by grace. Thank God. Verse 22, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Paul said, boy, I was called to preach to everybody that I could. Verse 24, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you. Boy, this is interesting. Paul is not uh, into self-inflicted uh, uh, you know, persecution. No, but Paul's saying, I rejoice that I sacrificed and went through very difficult persecution and hard times to get the ministry to you. Paul said, I, I, don't, I don't regret that. No, I rejoice in that, that I did that. I rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. So you remember that Paul, he wrote that God had given him these amazing revelations. And him being a Pharisee, he knew that Old Testament so well. And that book came alive to him. And he saw the Lord Jesus all over the Old Testament, prophesied about him, but he even saw Jesus showing up in the Old Testament. And he, he brought out these mysteries. So Paul's ministry was bringing out these truths and these mysteries that other people didn't know and that had been hidden for generations. So he goes on to say in verse 27, to them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. There's the mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory, that Jesus actually comes in you. He's the hope of glory inside of a person. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Notice, we're preaching to everybody, but we're also warning people. Because even somebody that's accepted Jesus, accepted the gospel, boy, you can get in the flesh and stop serving the Lord, stop following the Lord, stop submitting under his lordship. And he said, so we're preaching and warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. He said, we want to get you to the finish line and present you before the Lord, perfect uh, in Christ through grace, of course, but also your obedience. Verse 29, to this end, I also labor striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. So Paul said, man, God's working this in me mightily by the spirit, by the word of God. But I'm preaching this and bringing this to you so that God might work in you like this, that you would live for him passionately. Not that you're perfect or measuring up to salvation. No, but by his grace, God works these truths in you to where you walk with him the way that you ought to walk. Well, praise God. That's Colossians chapter 1, 